Uh, welcome to Chemistry 112. We're going to finish Chapter 12 today, start Chapter 13. Bear with me, I'm still getting used to my uh, document camera, so we'll deal with that uh, best we can. Okay, so I'm going to jump right to the uh, PowerPoint. As it is, we do not have very much left of chapter 12. We basically have to go through the remaining two types of solids. And that's really it. The, the next one, we, we, we started with metals, which are really close packed systems that they, where we shove the atoms as closely as they can to uh, adopt crystal structures where the atoms are as close as possible. The ionic solids, were ones where the cation and anion had to be close, uh, touching each other, but the cations had to be uh, spaced apart from the cations and anions apart from the anions. So one would adopt one shape, the other would adopt another, so that you have cation only touching anion, and vice versa. Well, molecular solids. Molecular solids are what happens when you have a distinct molecule freezing in a certain, uh, a distinct molecule freezing in a certain pattern. Uh, in order for this to happen, that you have two different things that is going to play a part in how these crystallize. One is our intermolecular forces. So they have to obviously, there isn't really strong forces going on here, you have to have like your hydrogen bonding or your dipole-dipole or your London dispersion forces. All of those are going to play a part how these guys pack together. But also you have to look at how well their shape, how well can they literally pack together? How, how do they fit close to each other? Because that's going to adopt what type of interactions we have. Obviously, the stronger intermolecular forces you have, the easier it is going to be to freeze. So dipole, dipole, and hydrogen bonding is going to result in a higher melting point, I meaning it's going to be solid at room temperature instead of a liquid at room temperature or a gas at room temperature. So the more intermolecular forces, the easier it's going to be to adopt a solid. But uh, the shape also contributes greatly. It's basically... The closer these atoms can get to each other, the stronger the intermolecular forces can play a part. And so the easier it is to freeze. The, the example I give here is benzene here. Benzene is a, essentially C6H6, a flat structure that has pi clouds. These kind of look like a dinner plate. And they stack very nicely. That this dinner plate structure, the pi cloud of this, this, this hexagon can sit on the pi cloud of the next hexagon and they stack and you have a really large interaction for that, that London dispersion forces. And so their melting point is actually five degrees C. Yes, that's a liquid at room temperature, but you could, in a cold room, or a cold fridge, you could actually solidify this. Now, toluene, which is a similar structure, it's a C7, instead of H6, it'd be C7H, H8, I do believe. It's essentially a benzene with a CH3 group. But the CH group, CH3 group puts a little spur on top of the on top of the structure. This keeps these plates from stacking quite so nicely. And because they can't stack nearly as nicely, they can't get as close of an interaction, and suddenly the melting point drops to negative 95. So you have to get really cold in order to make solid toluene, while this guy, benzene, just has to be a little chilly outside to freeze it because of the interaction. Typically, all things considered, 
the larger the structure, the higher the melting point. Yet this one, despite being one more carbon, has a melting point that is way lower, and that has to do with the packing efficiency. The same thing can be said about trans fats versus cis fats, and that the packing efficiency is going to keep one as a liquid and one as a solid. So, okay. The last one is covalent network solids. Covalent network solids are essentially solids made up of all nonmetals. What keeps this from being like a, uh, a molecule is that they don't have a defined stopping and ending point. So rather than being like CO2, which is one molecule, you have diamond, which is a repeating structure of carbon in a certain shape. So covalent network solids obviously are going to be held together by covalent bonds, just a continuous repeating pattern of covalent bonds that you can't separate into a single molecule. Because of this, they have a high melting point and they have like a pretty high strength. I said diamond structure is made up of all sp3 hybridized carbons bonded together with all sp3 hybridized carbons. So if you remember sp3, that shape, that, that tetrahedral shape where there's four atoms coming off the center shape. So it's basically every carbon has four other carbons coming off in a tetrahedral pattern. And the carbon bound to that has another three and so on and so on. This diamond structure and the zinc blend structure that we saw in the uh, in the ionic solids are going to be the chief shapes we're going to see in covalent solids. But there's also graphite. What makes graphite different from diamond is that instead of being layered as sp3 carbons, we have now a series of sp2 hybridized carbons. Remember, sp2 had the triangular planar, trigonal planar shape with a extra p orbital for making double bonds, which creates some localized d electrons. I mean, some the, the pi electrons. And of course, that's what makes graphite, you know, conductive. We have these delocalized pi electrons that allows with us to conduct electricity. So this last slide is just showing this. So this is just a cutout of the diamond structure here. That if you look here, this is just looking at like this guy's tetrahedral. You can see this guy's tetrahedral. We cut out some of the atoms for, to keep it being overly confusion. But this guy would also be tetrahedral, tetrahedral, tetrahedral. If you put it into a crystal structure lattice right there, that's what that would look like that one box. Essentially, the, uh, the carbon atoms as adopt a, like a face-centered cubic with additional four atoms within the body. So this structure actually has four, five, six, seven, eight atoms in that crystal structure. Now here's graphite over here. See here we have our sp2 hybridized, where it's three atoms coming off of it. And so they make a series of hexagons and they can actually layer on top of each other, which is the part of why they're easier to peel off. And there's actually, there was at least when I was going to college, some uh, degree of study of graphene layers where they peel off and create an individual layer of graphite. So instead of like these like onion, they peel it off and so they only have one layer and that gives it special properties that makes it even more effective. We have silicon carbide. Silicon carbide, this is adopting kind of the, the similar structure to we see right here. I think that's maybe zinc blend. Silicon dioxide. You look here, you can kind of see silicon dioxide adopts the same kind of uh, 
structure is this. The only difference is the, the oxygens are spaced between all the silicons. But it's the same generalized structure. Uh, a boron nitride can adopt two different shapes. One similar to the graphite, and one made closer to what we have here. And of course, this is a lesser known form of carbon, but Buckminster fullerene. It's actually actually an individual molecule right there where it's a C60, but it's a carbon made up of hexagons and pentagons. It essentially makes a shape of a soccer ball. And But that's just a form of the solid carbon that we can see. But all these are examples of covalent network salts. So they have high melting point, high strength, low conductivity, all except for graphite, low thermal conductivity. But that is our, no wait, we have one last check, one last thing, so a practice. So looking at this, what is the empirical formula of calcium fluoride? Now, in reality, if you are clever and a bit lucky, you could probably figure this out without doing this because calcium and fluorine, calcium is typically two plus, fluorine is typically one minus, what combination will these two come together? Well, two plus and one minus comes together in a one to two ratio. So what we should see is it one to two ratio in here. Sometimes it won't always be so obvious, but how would I go about this? So let's look where all the calciums are. There's calciums in all the corners. Remember each corner is one eighth, but there's eight corners. So all the corners add up to one. There's a calcium in all the faces, up, down, left, right, right, left, front, back. Each face is a half of an atom because half is in the cell, half is out of the cell. Six faces means there's three calciums there. So how many calciums are pictured in this atom? Four. Now here's the tricky part. These two calciums are fully outside of the cell. They are just shown there to kind of show the pattern. They're fully outside of the cell. So we can totally discount those. This atom and this atom, this atom, and the atom hidden here is inside the cell. You, you can't really see it, but there's a repeatable pattern. Two up, two down. Two up, there has to be two down. Now, this is neither in this corner, this is fully in the body. So top, left, front, top, left, back. Top, I say bottom, left, front, bottom, left, back. So four atoms there, repeating it again, another four atoms. Looking here, counting them all up, four total atoms from calcium, eight total atoms from fluorine. A four to eight ratio simplifies to a one to two ratio. So in a situation like this, a question like this, you would have to say, what is the simplest ratio of these atoms? If you gave four to eight, you'd probably still get it right. But the idea is you should be able to simplify it down. If you cannot simplify it down, maybe that's what it is. If it's a four to seven, but there are very few ones, something like that crazy. But so you want to determine the position and number of each atoms. Determine the next atom, continue till all atoms are defined. So this one just had green and blue. But say there is a red atom in there. You'd also have to consider the red atom. Sometimes you have a mixed metal ionic structure. So some of those will be what you have to deal with. But okay. That is all of chapter 
12. Do not forget the first set of assignments are due tonight. So if you don't have Achieve loaded up, work on that. If you remember, you don't have to have the card for like, once you load up for like the first week, maybe two weeks. I can't remember exactly, but it's at least a week once you first load it up. However, after that, you do have to get the access card. But the first thing is due tonight. It's just like the reading for chapter 12 and the reading and the, like, the relative learning curves. So it's not meant to be a lot, but it's meant to be, let's get started right away. We're already finished chapter 12, so you should have hypothetically read the hard parts of chapter 12. You should have done the easy learning curves. The homework's not due for like another week. The, the main assessment for chapter 12 is not due for another week, but the learning curves can, I'm trying to shoot for them being due like right after we finish the chapter. Because you could do most of the learning curves while we do the chapter, in fact. But okay. So, straight into chapter 13. It, this is basically looking at solutions and <clears throat> what's, go, what's going on and eventually get into colligative properties. There's going to be some little bit of tricky math here. Try to deal with it a bit at a time. Now, remember these simple terminology. We have a solution, which is what happens when a solute dissolves in a solvent. The solute is the thing that must be dissolved. The solvent is the thing that does the dissolution. This happens when the atoms fully surround this and separate them. Now, in chapter, the early chapters of general chemistry, we didn't really discuss why salts are insoluble. We just said, if you look at these rules, sometimes a salt won't form, sometimes it will form, like silver chloride. We just said, does forms a solid. Sodium chloride doesn't really form a solid. And so why is this? Because both are ionic solids. By definition, ionic solids should all dissolve but it doesn't really explain why. And so the reason is, is gonna come down to this chapter. We're gonna really start talking about why that happens. And the idea is the solute is always attracted to itself. So is the solvent. They're always attracted to themselves. It'd be clear if I have water, water has hydrogen bonds, hydrogen bonds is gonna to wanna to work with all hydrogen bonds. If I have a salt that has ionic inter interaction, ionic interaction always wants to bind with other ionic interactions. So obviously, the, having the same type of intermolecular forces wants to mix. Now, to form a solution, we have to break down intermolecular attractions between solute and solute. And we have to break down inter intermolecular attractions between solvent and solvent in order to form a new solute-solvent interactive force. Basically, we have to break up some of this guy, some of A, and some of B to make up a new A-B interaction. Now, there's another energy we're gonna talk about later called entropy. We're gonna talk about this when we get to the thermodynamics chapter, a lot more but entropy is the randomness of molecules. It's an energy that, that basically favors things like mixing. Mixing is a good, we, we randomize this up and it actually stabilizes this a bit. So we generate some energy when we mix these two guys together. So even though solvent sometimes has a stronger attraction, we gain some of this energy back with entropy. So the solvent with the advantage of strength in numbers, quantity can overcome the quality. However, 
if the intermolecular forces of the solvent and solute are too different in the strength, the solvent and solvent, the solute and solvent will not combine, which leads to the aphorism, like dissolves like. So water will dissolve most salts because water has strong hydrogen bonding and most salts have ionic forces. So you can create some strong ion dipole forces. Oils, which with the London dispersion forces will dissolve many other oils because of the London dispersion forces are both weak. They both want to dissolve each other. But when you mix water and oil, they will not dissolve because the forces are too dissimilar. It, it's basically, we can calculate that you break down these forces and you gain some energy. You, you, you cost some energy, but you get some of that energy back and you get some of that energy back as entropy as well as the intermolecular attraction. Now it's in cases like silver chloride, the ion ion strength is too strong. It's far stronger. The ionic interaction is far stronger than the new forces you would get by making water silver interactions and water chloride interactions. And so the solubility ends up being poor. It's too hard to pull away the molecules. It costs too much energy. If you put in a bunch of heat, you could maybe break it down and dissolve it. But at normal situations, this has a too high energy cost. So this is poorly soluble. Uh, it's not that the, it's not that the, uh, for example, it's not that the water couldn't break up the dispersion forces of the solute when it dissolves oil. It's not that the water couldn't break up the solute solute because A forces are weak. It's that the B forces are too strong. You wouldn't want to lose the water interaction to dissolve the oil. You have to have the sum of the new forces be similar to the cost of the old forces we're breaking. And so you can actually calculate an energy of mixing. The energy of mixing. So you can uh, say, because we're breaking and forming bonds, even if they're only intermolecular forces, we can actually calculate this enthalpy. So you basically, you look at breaking, the energy we break with all the solute solute, the energy we break when we do the solvent solvent, and we can calculate the energy we form when we make the new solute solvent interactions. And depending on where this ends up, we can calculate what's called the enthalpy of solvation. How much energy do you get or cost when you mix these together? If the energy of the new solvent solute are greater than the original intermolecular forces, you get a large exothermic reaction. So you ever think of those hot pads those hot pads, you, they, you crack them open, like the hot hands, you know, they squeeze them, you pop them, and essentially they say like pumping out heat. What do you essentially have? You have one, one solute on one side, you have solvent on the other, and when you like pop them, you activate them, you essentially break the barrier between the two. They start mixing together, and this dissolution produces a bunch of heat. And so you can slap it on there and they're just going to generate heat as they mix together. Now, in certain solute-solvent interactions, if they are weaker than the original, they must absorb energy. Then this writing to work. Now, because entropy can still push this forward, you can have cases where even though it costs energy to make these mixing, they will still mix. So cold packs, instant cold packs were like, icy hot, say the same thing. You can mix this in, you put a solid in the liquid, like ammonium nitrate, you put this in the liquid, 
you mix it up, it will dissolve, but it takes energy to do it. It will dissolve, but it needs energy. So where does it get it? It's going to start pulling heat from the atmosphere. It's going to get colder and colder as it absorbs heat from its surroundings. Now, if you put that against your body, it's going to feel really cold because it's going to find, oh, here's an ample heat source and start sucking the heat to make them work. So this is made favorable by an increase in entropy that you get when you break down these ionic forces. However, there is a limit. At some point, we'll get what's called saturation. Solubility is a process where energy is generated through the dissolution. Hypothetically, if you put the energy back, you could reverse the process. Sodium chloride can dissolve, but you put the energy back, you could actually crystallize it back out. Sometimes it might be required to, say, boil the water to do that to remove all the water, but you could crystallize the sodium chloride back out. Or you could, uh, by chilling the water enough, you could actually have it drop back out. Now the forward process is solvation or hydration. The reverse process would be crystallization. But for a given solution, there's a maximum amount of solute that could dissolve in a given amount of solvent at a given temperature. This is referred to as solubility. There's a limit. Even though we say sodium chloride can dissolve in water pretty well, there's a limit. You put enough sodium chloride in the water, you're gonna get salt floating on the bottom. There is a limit to how much sodium chloride you can dissolve. So in lab, we're gonna be dealing with things like saturated sodium chloride solutions. The idea here is we've put as much sodium chloride as is allowed in there. When it's at its maximum limit, it's called saturated. When no more will dissolve, we call this, oh wait, sorry, anything below the limit is unsaturated. Now, here's a neat thing. There's a demo I can do maybe in lab, but there's a situation called supersaturation. It's possible under certain circumstances, you can dissolve more solute than is said to be possible. It's called supersaturation. So how does this happen? Well, solubility is a function of temperature. So at a certain temperature, solubility is, say, the five grams. If I heat it up, the solubility may go up to 10 grams. You heat up some more, maybe it'll go up to 20 grams. Well, you heat it up to that higher temperature, you dissolve the 20 grams, and then you let it slowly cool back down. As long as the, it's not too much over the limit, we get what's called a supersaturation. We get a very metastable process where the, the solute is just barely contained by the water, just barely contained. It's barely dissolved such that any, any like uh, agitation could lead to a rapid crystallization once it's disturbed, like dropping in a small crystal starter. It's basically like if you have like a, kind of like a riot, it could be controlled by a small amount of like guards, but as soon as the people understand like, well, we greatly outnumber them, it's, it can quickly get out of control. The fact that they realize, oh, there's not enough solvent to keep us all solubilized. And so two atoms meet and crystallize. And then a third atom crystallizes onto it. And it, it's a chain domino-like type of reaction where it all crystallizes at once. And so it can have a really neat effect where you have a instant freezing, where you might have seen this if you put really pure water in the freezer and it somehow after a long period of time it remains liquid and then you kind of like shake the bottle and then boom it's all frozen all at once now there's some factors that will affect solubility some of these 
have different effects depending on what you're trying to dissolve. Because remember, you can dissolve solids into, into a solvent, you can dissolve liquids into a, another solvent, and you can dissolve gases into a solvent. Sodium chloride can go into water, ethanol can go into water, CO2 can go into water. So you're trying to carbonate some water. You say you're trying to make alcohol, say you're trying to just make sugar water or salt water, all these things. Intermolecular forces is the most, the easiest one to understand. Remember we said the like dissolves like. And it's basically, if they have similar strength and forces, they will dissolve really well. So if I have a polar gas, polar gas will dissolve really well. Non-polar gas, maybe not dissolve nearly as well. If the two liquids will mix together perfectly, so if there's no solubility limit, we, this is said to be a miscible solution. If they do not mix together at all, it's immiscible. So this is just a quick thing. If you look here, methanol, the solubility in water is infinity, meaning it is miscible. There is no amount of methanol you could add to water that would make this separate. If you added enough methanol, eventually it becomes a solution of methanol with uh, water as the solute because the solvent is the guy in greater quantities. Same thing with ethanol, same thing with propanol. As you get to butanol, you get larger and larger chains. The solubility in water decreases greatly. So even though all of these guys have hydrogen bonding, as the amount of dispersion force go up, as the amount of non-polar chain goes up, the solubility in water goes down. Now, if you look here, the solubility in, I think this is benzene, if I'm reading this right, Methanol is slightly soluble in benzene, but everything beyond that is soluble infinitely. It's miscible in benzene. Not benzene, uh, sorry, hexane. Because the nonpolar forces will mix with the nonpolar forces and it'll be perfect. Now, when we get an immiscible solution, we can get two visible layers that can be separated by density. And this is often done in organic chemistry. You'll create a layer of maybe halogens, a layer of organics, and a layer of like aqueous, sometimes a salt layer of aqueous. They'll help really separate them. These are colored for the uh, benefit of helping separate. So you, if you hook, uh, say you just wanted the white layer. What you would do is you would have a waste beaker you would slowly drain this out until it gets right down to the white, switch beakers, collect the white right before it gets to the red, and then you could switch beakers again and separate the red because it's only going to drain out one layer at a time. And so this way you could separate three different types of compounds just based on the solvent properties. But, let's see. Yeah. Now, the pressure effect is the hardest to understand. It Pressure will only affect gases. They will only affect gases. Pressure will not affect a solid dissolving, not affect a liquid dissolving. It's only going to affect gases. And the reason being here is the gases have that kinetic force, they constantly want to be escaping back into the gas phase. So what's happening when you put pressure on this, you are pushing them into the solution. So high pressure is going to help dissolve a gas. Low pressure was going to help a gas escape. Uh, it's basically we're pushing it down and saying, how easy is this gas to escape, remember when we talked about vapor pressure, how easy is it going to be to escape back up? So much, this is so dependent, we can actually rate what's called Henry's Law. Henry's Law just says molarity is equal to a constant for the gas, for the, for the gas at, in that solution, times the pressure of that gas. 
So if I want to figure out how much CO2, for example, dissolves in water, the constant is set. I just if I want more concentration, I put more pressure. If I want less concentration, I put less pressure. And I can just figure that out just by a linear relationship. Now, temperature, oh yeah, I say temperature one is the really the hardest one to understand because temperature ha does the same thing everything, but it has opposite effects from solids and liquids than it does from gases. Because what does temperature do? When you increase the temperature, you're increasing the kinetic energy of all things involved. The kinetic energy of the solutes, the kinetic energy of the solvents. Now, when you increase the kinetic energy what you start to do is you start to break up intermolecular attractive forces. When you increase the kinetic energy, you break up the intermolecular attractive forces of the solute solute and the solvent solvent. In solids and liquids, more often than not, this will help things dissolve. Most things will dissolve at a higher temperature because most times the energy of mixing is exothermic. So, uh, sorry, endothermic, meaning the energy it takes to, break, to dissolve this will go up when we do, well, uh, basically it takes energy to help dissolve this. Now, if the energy of mixing is exothermic, temperature will have an opposite effect. So if, it, if mixing these two things together produces heat, then it's not, then cooling it down will help it dissolve. But most times, solids and liquids will dissolve better at higher temperature because essentially the kinetic energy helps break apart the solutes, helps break apart the solvent so they can mix. Now, gases, however, always decrease in solubility with increasing temperature. Because remember, gases always want to be escaping from liquid into the gas. If you give them more kinetic energy, the easier it is going to be to escape into the gas phase. It's like a rocket trying to escape the atmosphere. If you give it more energy, there's always a greater chance of it getting into outer space. It doesn't matter how, interact, how well the interaction is with water. You give it more energy, the easier it is going to be to escape. In the same way, increasing temperature always increases the vapor pressure. Just think about a soda. You have, if you have a soda in a hot car, you open it up, it's more likely going to explode. It's more likely going to go flat sooner because the carbon dioxide dissolved in that soda is going to have more energy to escape. You have cold soda, it's going to stay fresh longer because it has less energy for that gas to try to bubble out and escape. So what we're going to do now is look at some really annoying math. So up until now, we've used molarity and only molarity to calculate concentrations, but that is not the only way we can measure concentrations. In fact, there are several different ways which we'll go over. Mass percent, mole fraction, and molality. They all have a similar setup, but it's slightly different. Mass percent is literally a convenient way of measuring uh, the concentration using only a balance. It's looking at mass of solute over mass of solution. There's actually two other ways that similar to mass percent that you may have heard of that we won't study, which is 
parts per million and parts per billion. Essentially looking at, it's often used to uh, measure trace amounts of metal and water. Like if you look at recently the Flint water crisis, that was quite a while ago, but now they're finally putting the charges in, charging people for this gross negligence. You would talk about what concentration of lead was in the drinking water and they'd say, oh, it's so many parts per million, so many parts per thousand, so many parts per billion, whatever. And it's a way of measuring how much metal is in how much mass of drinking water. Now, if you look at a hydrogen peroxide bottle, it gives you the active ingredient and mass percent. If you look at a vinegar bottle, you can buy at the store, it'll give you 5% vinegar, 5% acidity vinegar. Or if you have a special cleaning one, 10% vinegar. And that is a mass percent. The mole fraction is a similar way to, but it measures proportional quantities only using moles. And molality, molality is probably the worst of them, but it is one of the ones we will have to use a little bit more. It's very similar to molarity, but unlike molarity, it is temperature independent. Temperature independent, which is useful when you're dealing with situations where the temperature will change. It's, it's ha the nature of how it's measured will make it temperature independent. So the molality will not change if you heat it up, cool it down, the same way molarity will. So molality is small m, mass percent is usually per, just a percentage. Mole fraction is often seen as the Greek letter, I think, I think it's chi, but it's the, the big X one. But so we'll go about this in the next slide. So first let's give the equation. Mass percent is literally just mass of solute over mass of solution. You don't even need to know what's the molar mass, any of that. You just look at, I have five grams of vinegar in a hundred grams of vinegar solution. Times a hundred would be 5%. The hundred percent does not limit the sig figs. So the only thing that would limit the sig figs would be the the, 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 the two numbers, the mass solute over mass solution. Now, mole fraction is similar. It's just defined as the moles of solute over the total moles of solution. So you would actually have to find moles of this guy and moles of that guy, and you have the sum of the moles. So I'm going to start looking at this practice. Let's see. So we'll see how this works. Okay. Okay, looking right here. If hydrogen peroxide is 3% by mass, what is the concentration if the density of solution is 1.01 grams per mil? So I'm turning percent by mass into concentration and I'm turning, and the next one is what is the mole fraction of 30 grams of ethanol and 15 grams of methanol is dissolved in 100 grams of water. So let's see, what did we have here? I just need to look this up again. 3% by mass hydrogen peroxide, 1.0 gram per mil. What's, what do we know? 3% by mass and density is 1.01 .01 gram per mil. So 3% by mass is equal to the mass of H2O2 over mass of solution times 100. Now here's one where we really have to think this through. 
we are not given both of these. But we can, because this is a ratio, we can use a ratio. So whatever I use for the mass of solution, it's going to determine what is the mass of peroxide. If I use more water, I'm going to have more peroxide. If I use less water, use less peroxide. So one thing I can do is I can either say I have 100 grams of solution or 1,000 grams of solution. I'll go ahead and do 100 grams of solution to make this a little bit easier right now. Assume 100 grams solution. So 3% equals X over 100 grams times 100. So what is that going to give us? That is going to give us the mass of peroxide. The mass of peroxide, with that being that, would then be 3 grams of HO2 in 100 grams. Now, molarity is going to be moles of H2O2 in volume of solution. So I have to turn the three grams into moles and I have to turn the 100 grams of solution into liters of solution. Now, each of these is a step we have to do. So three grams, don't forget our like stupid dimensional analysis crosshatch method. Hydrogen peroxide, there's two oxygens, each at 16 is 32. There's two hydrogens, each at one. So the total mass is 34 grams of peroxide per one mole of peroxide. H2O2. Then, sorry, just borrowing my calculator. Do, do, do. So three divided by 34 gives me 0 0.088. I'm gonna, that's about as good as I can get. Now, the volume, my volume is going to be, we're going to have to turn 100 grams into mils. 100 grams, the density is 1.01 gram for one mil. And there is 1,000 mils in one liter. So this one's going to be a little different, but not quite not quite too bad, 1,000. So my volume, the volume is 0 0.099 liters. So density of 0, uh, sorry, moles 0 0.088 divided by 0 So 0 0.088 divided by 0 0.099 puts us at a molarity of 0.89 molar. 0.89 molar. So what did we do? We set up our first equation and found each of the masses. Then we converted masses of, of solute to moles, and mass of solution to liters. And that's how we converted mass percent to molarity. How would we go backwards? So if I gave you this is one molar solution, I would say, well, this is one mole in one liter of solution. So I would turn liters of solution 
to grams, and then I'll turn moles back into grams. And convert vice versa. So the next problem, real quick. Uh, Real quick, uh, just pulling this back up. 30 grams of ethanol, 15 grams of methanol, 100 grams of water. Now, in actuality, I would have uh, given you the formulas of these guys, but uh, I know them, so I'm going to just going to cheat. 15 grams of C. H4O, and then I think I said 100 grams of water. Let's go back one more time. 100 grams of water. So on a test type situation, I would totally give you uh, the molecular formulas of these guys. So you wouldn't have to be like, what's, that? what's methanol? What's ethanol? And then you'd be like, out of luck. So for a mole percent, for mole fraction of ethanol. We're going to have to find moles of each guy and the total moles. So moles of eth is going to be over the moles eth plus moles meth plus moles water. So it's just a matter of looking and converting these guys. Ethanol, 30 grams. The, we have two carbons, each carbon at 12. That's 24. Six hydrogens, each hydrogen at one. Makes it up to 30. One oxygen at 16. The total molar mass is 46 grams per one mole. Like, where is Andrew getting those? You gotta remember, periodic table. You will always be given a periodic table. I just happen to know the really common ones. So 0 0.65 moles of ethanol. 15 grams. 12 plus four plus 16 puts ethanol, sorry, methanol at 32 grams in one mole. 32 grams in one mole. So, there we go, 0.47 moles meth. I'm rounding to two sig figs. And then 100 grams of water, 16 plus 2, it's 18 grams in one mole. Okay. About 18 equals 5 point, we'll just say 5, 6 moles. So to do the mole fraction, we're going to say 0.65 over 0 0.65 times 0 0.47, 0 0.47 plus 5.56. So the sum of all of them on bottom is 6.68, 65, six. Is so the mole fraction is 0 0.097. It's pretty small, but that's because water plays such a large part. Pretty small because water plays such a large part in this guy. Okay, okay. So, as I said, you, you've missed out some of this.
the work is on the slide. Work is always on the slide. I'm just putting you through the paces of how hard it could be. It's not going to be ideally not going to be this hard all the time, but it. This is some of the stuff you might have to calculate. Okay. Now, molarity, I'm just giving you molarity again for comparison, but we have molarity and molality. Molarity is defined as moles of solute over liters of solution. We just did that one. Molality is largely different in that how it's defined is not in the quantity of solution, but the quantity of solvent. And that it's not given as a volume of solvent, it's given a mass of solvent. So molality, which is small m, is defined as the moles of solute over the kilograms of solvent. Easy to calculate when you're forming a molality, harder to calculate when it's already made. Because if you weigh out like, oh, I'm going to weigh out five grams of this, I know the moles of this. And then in order to make that, you just add a set amount of solvent. You're like, oh, I need to add five kilograms of solvent to dissolve that down. When you do the molarity, you typically have to dissolve it until it reaches a certain quantity. You have to account for changes in the, the, the solvent volume as the solution forms. Molality, you do not have to. Now, molality is going to be particularly useful when we look at colligative properties, where the properties of solutions where when the temperature changes. Because molality is independent of, of, of temperature because of density. Density is a temperature-dependent thing. Just look at water. Water is actually at its densest at like, I think, four degrees Celsius. It, it from higher than four degrees, water density goes up, 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 up. And when you get below four, it also goes back up again until it form, finally forms ice. So you have essentially a like a bottom point at four degrees. And depending on when you make this solution, the density will change. If you go at 100 degrees, the density will be a little bit different than if you make it at, say, 25 degrees. And because of that, the volume will change. If the volume changes, moles over volume, the molarity would also have to change. Water's maybe not the best example because the density doesn't change overly drastically. But the fact of the matter is the molarity will in fact change depending on when you measure this, what temperature you measure this at because the density changes. But the mass, the mass, the total mass will not have changed. It will have stayed the same the whole time, which is why molality is said to be temperature independent. So this last practice problem, we have 2.5 molar solution of sulfuric acid, H2SO4. There has a density of 1.11 grams per mil. What is the molality? What's the molality of this thing? So. Start with what we know. We can define 2.5 molar as 2.5 moles of sulfuric acid and one liter of solution. Now, here's where it, it becomes a little bit harder. Molality is going to be 2.5 moles of, of H2SO4 in 
X kilograms of solvent. One of the first things we are going to do is we're going to turn liters of solution into grams of solvent. Liters of solution into grams of solvent. Uh, the, sorry, liters of solution into grams of solution. One liter with a density of 1.11 grams. So there's in one liter, there is a thousand milliliters and 1.11 grams per one milliliter. How many grams of solvent do we have? One times a thousand, one. We should have one, 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 zero grams of solution. Now, it's not enough just to have that. Here's the problem. This is total grams of solution. That means this gram, this mass is a mass of both solvent and solute. We cannot simply say, oh, we can use that. We can't simply use that. We have to figure out how much of that 1,110 grams is solvent and how much of it is solute. And the way we do this is by figuring out how many grams would 2.5 moles take up. So 2.5 moles times the molar mass and one mole of H2SO4. Well, let's start there. Two hydrogen at one apiece, one sulfur at 32, and four oxygens at four, uh, four oxygens at 16 apiece. Puts the mass at 98 grams. 98 grams of, of sulfuric acid per mole. Now we multiply that by our two and a half moles. So 2.5 molar sulfuric acid would contain 245 grams of solute. 245 grams of solute. So in order to figure out how many grams of solvent we have to subtract the 245 grams from the 1,110. And that will give us how much of it is solvent. So you should have 865 grams of solvent. Turning this into kilograms, there is a thousand grams in one kilogram, means we would have 0.865 kilograms. Last step, so we take our original 2.5 moles divided by our 0.865 kilograms, and that would give us, what is our molality? It changes it to 2.89 molal. 2.89 molal. I go back onto here. Give me a second to pull, pull everything back up. Okay. Okay. So the first step, I determined the moles of solute, the mass of solution. I had to calculate the mass of solvent, and then finally get the molality. So that's all broken down into each of the steps. As I said, that is, that is probably one of the hardest things you can do. It's not particularly nice. It's helpful if you can start with molality. Or in the lab, we will do involving this in a couple weeks. 
it it won't be nearly as bad because you'll be dealing with two solids that can mix together. And so as long as you know the mass of one and the mass of the other, you just turn one of them into moles and the other is already in kilograms. So you don't have to think about it overly hard. Here's a quick re-summary. Molarity, symbol is capital M. It's moles per liters of solution. Mass percent is grams per grams of solution. Molality, it's moles per kilogram of solvent. And mole fraction is moles per moles of solution or total moles. In most problems, we will need of the components and the density in order to solve this. In almost all the problems, we'll need the molar mass and the density to convert between the two. Oh, shoot. We will finish up with this problem. And that'll be the end of uh, this. It's already showing the answer, but we'll work on this. Standard E10 gasoline is 10.5 mass percent ethanol. 10.5 mass percent ethanol. What is the molarity and what is the molality given the density? 0.7489 grams per mil. Yeah. Okay. Mass percent ethanol. C two H six O. So ten point five percent is going to be we can say ten point five over a hundred. Ten point five grams over a hundred times a hundred. That'll make our life a little bit easier. I said, I'm making an assumption to make my life easier. If I take this out of 100 grams, it's going to be 10.5 grams of solute. If I did over 1,000 grams of solution, it would be 105 grams of ethanol. So we can do this. 10.5. So 10.5 grams. In all the cases, we have to find moles. What did I say the molar mass of ethanol was? We just did that back here, 46. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and go back 46 grams of ethanol per mole. So the moles of ethanol is 10.5 divided by 46, 228 moles. Now, what do we want to solve for? Molarity or molality? Both of these are actually pretty easy to solve for this. It's not nearly as hard to turn mass percent into molality as it is to turn mass percent it, as it is to turn molarity into molality. But so with this in mind, molarity is moles per liters. If I want to do that, I need to find out how many liters are 100 grams. So volume, we have 100 grams. Our density is 0.7489 grams per one mil. And there is a thousand mils in one liter. Doing that math, doing that math, 100 divided by 0.7489 divided by 1,000 is, the volume is 0 0.133, well, 134 one, or liters. So molarity is going to be our 0.228. 0.134 liters. So what is the molarity? 
0.228 divided by 0.134. The, the molarity of 10% ethanol is 1.7 molar ethanol in our gasoline. It doesn't matter that the solvent isn't water. We don't have to figure out for the solvent. We, we, the density takes care of that. Now, doing molality. Mol molality, remember, is moles per kilogram solvent. However, we already have the grams of solute and the grams of solvent. So kilograms is just going to be 100 minus 10.5 all times there's a thousand grams in one kilogram. So that's going to be what, like, ah, shoot. So that's going to be 100 minus 10.5 is 89.5 divided by a thousand means this is going to be 0 0.8, 0 0.0895 kilograms. So 0.228 divided by 0 0.0895. Two eight divided by point zero eight nine five is going to give us a molarity of a molality of point two five five molal two five five molal. Going back to the slide, that's what we end up seeing. You look at the work, so that is what we have. So it is a process. As I said, this is a harder level of chemistry than say some of the Gen Chem one. So we have to think about it. We have to work about it systematically. I will give you all the equations. I'm never expecting you to memorize this equation or that equation, but you have to be able to work it through. That's what some of the practice problems will be. That's what some of the test problems will be. Not a ton of the test problems, but maybe one or two might be one of these conversion type problems. So you've got to be able to at least do them to get like all of the test right. But that is where we are going to finish up for today. Thank you for your time. Uh, and I will see you guys on Thursday or in and in lab.